Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture, uh, BC310 Church and Ministry Administration. We are talking about culture, the culture within the organization and within the community, how we go about um, developing this culture and maintaining this culture. Any questions so far on what we've covered? On uh, we basically went through looking at what's a healthy culture, what's a toxic culture. Uh, any questions? Okay, let's move forward. Uh, we'll try to cover the rest of the uh, content here on this chapter. <clears throat> so. Um, how do we evaluate the culture of an organization, right? So generally, uh, when you step into an organization, you observe, you see people, how they work, how they move, how they interact. Uh, you can get a sense of the culture that prevails in the organization or in the congregation. You can just get a sense just by observing, uh, you know, looking at the way people interact, the way the leaders interact, the teams interact, and, all, and so on. So sometimes we go in a place where you know one person is doing everything, or everything is around, centered around that one person, and uh, uh, then you get a get a sense that uh, you know uh, maybe everything is you know very focused in that person's hands he's very could be very controlling i'm not saying every time but it he could be very controlling there are no other leaders not being raised up uh, opportunities not being given to people you can you know observe those kinds of things or when you come into a place where you see lots of people serving uh, then you say wow this is a place where people have a mindset a servant mindset it says so many people are serving everybody's doing something you know, so that's a beautiful thing to notice. See, in 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 a in a congregation or in a community, uh, or in an organization, right? So you can observe and you can assess what is the culture of this organization or community or church congregation. So generally, uh, you know, if you listen to the stories and the experiences of people, uh, you get a sense about the culture. Um, how do they perceive leadership? You know, you ask them, you know, what, what are the most interesting things that you can say about your leadership and listen to what they say. And, you know, they will begin to highlight what they say is actually a highlight of the culture that they are experiencing, you know. Uh, uh, what are the repeated practices? What are people really excited about? You know, so, oh, you know, we, we do this every, every month or we keep doing this every year. Then it's... Um, it's something that reveals to us what the culture is. And how do people behave? Are they open, friendly, sharing, supportive, or uh, does everything have to be referred to the pastor? And you know, then that's if if that's the case, and that's very controlling. But if people are very open, friendly, sharing, they can move around, talk around to each other. Then it's that's a that's a healthy culture. How do people feel about the organization? Are people inward looking or outward focused? Are people risk takers? Are they entrepreneurial? Are they innovative? Are they just totally averse to doing something new? You know, um, is the organization hierarchical, or is it fl flat and free? So just by observing all these kinds of things, and just a few questions here, but just by observing these kinds of things, you can get a sense of what is the culture all about. You know, of that organization or that uh, community, okay? So it's important for us to you know, keep an eye, uh, keep a sense on what is going on, what's happening in the culture, and uh, then wherever there's a need, uh, we need to you know, make corrections, right? Now, some places, uh, they do uh, a questionnaire and they tell different pe people to rate it and uh, how they feel. Uh, about you know different things, uh, the individual performance or teamwork. So you can you can contrast these these two things and see you know what is the main thing 
that is happening within the organization you know is it individual performance or is it teamwork is it centralized or is it decentralized is it driven by rules or is it driven by objectives uh, is it people focus or is it task focus is there's emphasis on service or em emphasis on doing things tradition versus change and so on you see this is another way uh, by a, another way to really assess what's going on in terms of culture right so we could make a chart like this get people to fill it and we could do a realistic uh, assessment of the culture of the organization and then of course uh, we can then take corrective action so one is just by observation you look at what's going on you know generally assessing things keeping a pulse on these things or you could do a formal questionnaire and determine the question is useful when it's a very large organization and uh, yeah so then it gives everybody a chance to express themselves right in closing the most important thing is we must nurture kingdom culture within our organization or in the church community right that means what would the kingdom of God look like? Right? So we want to come as close to that as possible. I'm not saying we can be perfect. You know, as long as people are there, <laughs> there will always be faults and imperfections because we are all works in progress. But as far as possible, come as close to kingdom culture. You know, follow that. Let the king kingdom of God, the values of God's kingdom be what we express. Right, so things like compassion, faith, courage, humility, servanthood, sacrifice, generosity, hard work, perseverance, you know, or pioneering, uh, faithfulness, fruitfulness, unity, teamwork, integrity, exalting Jesus. So these are all kingdom culture, you know, parts of uh, expressions of kingdom culture, and that's what we want to see in the Christian organization or in the church organization or in the congregation, right? And we need to nurture these things. So these things won't happen by themselves. Uh, we have to nurture this, model this, uh, require people to be aligned to this and recognize and reward this kind of expression of kingdom culture, right? And so organizationally, what should we do? Uh, most of, you know, and here are some practical things. You know, of course, you want to hire the right people, hire people who fit into this culture. So you can ask questions, see if they actually fit into it, uh, and uh, you need to, you know, on, on an ongoing basis, preserve the organization's traditions and culture. Uh, you protect it, preserve it. Uh, encourage communication that we can talk about things freely uh, and uh, exchange ideas and we create language that expresses our culture we recognize and reward positive behavior aligned to the culture if it's contrary to the culture we address it you hold people accountable and we don't feed toxic behavior so this is a problem that we have seen in the church and it's it's you know it's 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 coming to light more and more these days and uh, and you know uh, when we uh, when we see globally what's happening in various churches or christian organizations uh, the tendency is to cover up you know that means uh, when there is toxic behavior what do many churches do? They just cover it up. You know, they don't address it. They don't expose it. They don't, you know, take action on it. And then it comes out, you know, years later. But but at the time it comes out, it's huge. It's big, and it makes news. You know, for example, it could be sometimes or very often it's with the leadership. Uh, the 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 toxic behavior of the leadership is just tolerated and it's covered up. And then finally, you know, after 20 years, 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years, it comes out, and then it makes big news. And uh, but the actual problems were started, you know, many many years ago, or there could be problems within the congregation. And if that's not addressed, uh, it comes out much later, right? So the key is, you know, we should avoid covering up, address it, and don't feed into bad uh, behavior toxic behavior so that's how we protect the 
organization culture. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this chapter. Uh, before I move into the next chapter, um, uh, any any questions? Uh, anything you want to talk about? Um, hi, Pastor. Um, I have a question regarding the, uh, the list about uh, holding accountability. Um, so, in an organization, when uh, everybody has a task uh, to do, so how are they hold accountable? Uh, I mean, task level, maybe you can uh, go and see if the work is done and how it's being done. Maybe we can do a survey or feedback. But um, how do we? you know hold them accountable on it do we hold them accountable on a personal level um uh, that's what my question is uh when you say sorry like when so task they're doing a task uh so we can see if they're doing the task or not but when you say hold them accountable at a personal level meaning the behavior you're talking about uh yes pastor because um I mean, we, we heard in the class about the situations, uh, things came into the light after a file and then uh, had to take action about it. Um, in order to prevent those kind of situations, or is there something that we can uh, kind of put into practice so that we can also um, not hold them in the sense, not questioning them or confronting them about anything, but something in place as a church organization. Uh, especially staff in this case, uh, that we can uh, do a regular spiritual checks or, um, you know, accountable in that way. Yeah. So one is, you know, in terms of behavior, in terms of this, you know, the, the behavior. Okay. So task is done, but maybe the hard attitude is not the right or uh, something else. The behavior is not right. Um, uh, so a couple of things that happened. One is if, the hard attitude is not right, or the the behavior is not right. That comes out. The people tell us, you know, if somebody's being rude, somebody's being uh, aggressive, if somebody is not having a good attitude, they're proud, they're arrogant. The news comes back. Somebody will report it to us, right? So what I was trying to emphasize is, at that time, we shouldn't cover it up. We should just address it, like, hey. You know what's going on. Your attitude is not right, or you're not walking in humility, or uh, you're being very abusive or controlling, or yeah, you know whatever that that problem is. Uh, so it does come. People generally they report it, but the problem in many churches is they don't take action. Right? They just ignore it. Oh, kids, leave it. But uh, we have to take action. We call them up, sit down, and have a conversation. Hey, what's going on? And uh, and we do that uh, when it's you know when people report it and usually people they do tell us like you know somebody's being very harsh or somebody's you know then they're not acting they're not acting according to kingdom values uh, then that comes back. The other thing that happens is we constantly reinforce these values in our staff meetings. So we go over the core values. So staff and pastors meetings in both these situation settings. Uh, we go over our core values. We constantly repeat, you know, this is the way we're supposed to be doing things. This is the way because we tend to forget, right? So uh, we repeat this. So that's another way where people can check up. That, hey, am I doing this? Uh, is my is my spiritual life okay? And like for example, we say it's not just about doing the ministry. You ministry is an overflow of your personal walk with God. So keep your spiritual life in check. Uh, in our staff meetings, you know, one hour is a meeting, but one hour is also given to prayer and spiritual matters. Where we, every month, we're emphasizing that, uh, yeah, we're doing ministry, uh, we're learning about ministry, but we also need to stay focused on our spiritual life. So, the regular meetings, uh, which typically happens monthly, is a good way for us to remind people. And in a in a not so direct way, but we are repeating certain things that we do, uh, so people are reminded, and uh, it will help in the process of uh, changing behavior and so on. So I can think of these two things. Yeah. Thanks, Pastor. Thank you. Um, any other questions?
on culture within the organization or within the community? Yeah. So, uh, so throughout, you know, uh, our journey, we have to be constantly on guard, and um, you know, watch over ourselves to to embody uh, the culture that we want to create uh, within the organization. Right. So, um, that's that's most important. So, let me just go to the next topic, next chapter. We're changing topics a little bit now, and. Um, We'll talk about finances. Um, uh, so, in uh, in any organization, and uh, whether it's a local church, or whether it's a Christian organization, or whether it you know somebody's doing a traveling itinerant ministry, evangelist ministry, or missions, whatever, in any setting, money is important. We need money. We need money to do the work, um, you know, for all the practical things that we need to do. It costs money, and uh, uh, in in the context of what we are talking about, money comes as donations. It comes as contributions. Mean, <clears throat> meaning, people are giving to us. So, so we are not, you know, we are not selling products or you know, we, 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 things like that, but. People are contributing to the church or the, or the Christian ministry of their own free will. Uh, they are giving their tithes and their offerings, uh, just as 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 they feel led by God. They're giving, but we have to manage it properly. Right? We can't take it for granted. Uh, we cannot be careless in uh, how we manage the money. So there is a proper way to do this, and this is very, very important. Now, the fact is, sometimes organizations, entire organizations can, or Christian organizations and ministries can, uh, what to say, can crumble, can fall, uh, simply because of this one area of uh, not managing money, not taking care of it properly. And on the other hand, we also have, sadly, examples of misuse, you know, of money. So much money comes that uh, the organization or sometimes the individuals within the organization, basically individuals with the organization, misuse the money. And uh, that also brings a bad name. You know, I, and I remember many years ago, there was a wonderful man of God uh, in, in the US. Uh, and at that time, again, he was like a rising star in the Christian world. And uh, he was really into the prayer movement. Uh, he was like a leader in the prayer movement. And the this was in the 90s, 90s, yeah. And uh, uh, Pastor Larry Lee he was a graduate of Oral Roberts University. He went to um little rock i think uh, um, i think it's in texas and he had started church on the rock and um, but he himself had a nationwide ministry and he had written many books on prayer uh, and they're, they're wonderful books you know so the books are still good to read wonderful books uh, and one book um, the, one of the books that is very well known for was uh, could you not tarry one hour and that you know that went global. People all over the world were reading it, uh, and he was into spiritual warfare and prayer, and and they used to have these massive, massive uh, meetings. So go into a city, they would fill up a whole stadium full of people praying for the city. So there was you know just amazing. God was using him, wonderful, and it was amazing in those days because you know to get a whole stadium full of people just to pray. You know, it was amazing. Like uh, it was just, you know, so it was uh, really a move of God and everything that was happening. And uh, he had a powerful ministry, but um, 
what happened, and I'm not saying this is the only thing that happened, one of the one of the main things that happened was some television channel, I forget which, uh, which television channel, they uh, reported, uh, and they, 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 they documented, they caught on camera, and they reported that money was not being handled properly. You know, they they saw about how you know all these, and people sent and and people from all over the country were sending their, you know, their contributions to church to this ministry. Uh, they would send the prayer request, they would send the check and all that, but uh, you know, like the check would be taken, the envelopes thrown, and uh, so they just caught this on camera. They put it on uh, on this TV, and it was it became like a big news. It became very. Very, very, uh, you know, it just it just went all over the country. Now, if you think about it, uh, it wasn't the pastor who was doing this, right? He was he was ministering. He was busy doing his ministry, but somewhere in the in the whole ministry, people who are responsible for handling all this, obviously, the pastor is not sitting and opening every envelope. That he doesn't have time for it. He's doing his ministry, but in the organization, the way things were being handled uh, was not right, and that was exposed on TV. And uh, it was so bad, and uh, I, I, you know, it just became a ripple effect. And you know, literally overnight, everything collapsed. The ministry collapsed, and uh, he went into a depression, and it was too much. It was. Uh, at that time, you know, in those days, it was very, very difficult time. No, he was a good man. You know, he was just focusing on the ministry. You know, he was focusing on prayer, and God was using him powerfully. So he was a good man. But in the organization, you know, something went wrong, and uh, everything collapsed. Um, and this is just one example. Like you know, we can talk about so many examples where, you know, big and small, big churches, big ministries, small churches, small ministries, where when there is a mismanagement of money, it can affect the whole ministry, the whole church, and uh, lots of problems. And many times, a bad name is brought uh, to the name of Jesus because of mismanagement of funds. So uh, we need to be very careful of this area. And uh, we need to, you know, as a leader, of course, you are not sitting and counting the offering. I don't sit and count the offering. I don't do it. I don't have time. We, leaders don't. We, we just don't do it. Somebody else is doing it, right? There's their accountants. They're uh, finance people. They're doing all that. but. You have to, it is still your responsibility to make sure that things are done properly. And you need to check, uh, because if you don't check, uh, you know, you, we won't know what's going on. So we have to keep that, uh, this area of finance, of money, uh, we have to really take care, because if something goes wrong, the whole ministry can be affected, right? So. Uh, let's talk about this. Now, from a biblical perspective, when it comes to money, uh, what should we do? Right? How do we approach it? I'm talking about in the, in the ministry. I'm not talking about personal things, but I'm talking about in the ministry, right? How should we do it? The first principle is this, that you share a vision and let God stir up the people to give toward the vision, right? So, don't never, never force people, never manipulate people, never pressurize people into giving. Right? All we have to do is share a vision. See, God has called us to do this. Right? And you give as you feel in your heart, and you give according to what God has blessed you. Of course, God, different people have different things. Uh, people are in different seasons of life. 
people have different uh, resources. Okay, just give as you are able. And this is what also the Bible teaches, right? For example, in both Old and New Testament, you see this. In the Old Testament, when God wanted to build a tabernacle, he told Moses, Moses, tell the people to bring me an offering, each one according to what they are able and what is in their heart. Right? And the people brought. When David, First Chronicles 29, when he was making preparations for building the temple, same thing. You know, God had given him the plans. And then David told people, he said, people, you bring what you want to give. I have given according to what God has given me. Each one, give as God, as you purpose in your heart. You know. So that's the first thing. Second principle is, so spiritually, people will give financially. So it's 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 again. This is a biblical principle, right? First, you sow spiritually into their lives, without expecting anything. Just give, give the word of God, give spiritually into their lives, pray for them, serve them spiritually, and God will move on some of their hearts to sow financially. But you don't expect it from any person, right? You don't say, well, I prayed for you to give me five rupees. No, it's not like that. Yourself. And let God move on their hearts. If you, you know, if you serve a hundred people, maybe God may move on ten people to give. It's okay. You don't, you don't, you know, uh, force anybody to give. The goal is, I will serve spiritually. Let God move on their heart. To give financially because some people may be able to give some people may not be able to give mm, some people may give now some people may give in the future all those things are there so you don't look at the people we just look to God say Lord I am going to serve them spiritually okay. then we must also be a good steward so along with being responsible in spiritual things we should also be good stewards of money you know, in, in Luke 16, it's a very interesting parable. When Jesus spoke about the parable of the unjust steward, he gave that parable, and then towards the end, he made three important statements and uh, the lessons from the parable. And one of them he said was, if you have not been faithful, or if you have been unfaithful in the unrighteous mammon, that means with money, then who will commit to your trust true riches or eternal riches? Means if you or let me put it in a positive way, if you if we can be faithful with money, then God can trust us with the true riches, with eternal things, with spiritual things. So this is a kingdom principle. If God can trust you with money, He can trust you with spiritual things. If you prove yourself faithful in how you handle the money God has given you, then He will trust you with the two riches, the things of His kingdom that He wants you to handle. Right? So there is that, you know, that, um, uh, what to say, that, that correlation in one sense that if you're faithful with money, then God can trust you with things of His kingdom. So be a good steward of money. And then be accountable to the people who gave, right? Um, and I've heard of many, many cases, you know, sometimes people come and they share some of their problems and some of their experiences. And now I remember quite a few people who've come and you know, they've shared things like, you know, they were going to a church and the pastor would say, you know, I'm collecting money to buy a by uh, some musical equipment equipment for the church. So they gave uh, whatever large sums, or they, he may say, I I'm going to build a children's home. And so they gave large sums of money. And then uh, that particular thing he raised money for was never done. So the people would, but then instead he went and bought a car for himself, or he went and spent the money on something for himself. And when they went and asked the pastor, you know, you, you took money for this particular cause, but uh, what happened to it? Then he'll say, you don't ask me. You gave to God, you don't ask me. 
In other words, he's not being answerable to the people who gave. And he went and did whatever he wanted with the money. Right? But Paul teaches us examples. 2 Corinthians 6 3, he says, We give uh, we, we give no offense to any anyone so that the ministry will not be blamed. Second Corinthians 8 20 21 he says we hold things honor honorable in the providing for things honorable in the sight of God and man right so we must be right in God's sight but we must also be right in man's eyes you know? so we are accountable to the people who have given the money we can't just take the money and do whatever we want no it's with very and as a good steward the people have trusted you with the money make use of it you know and uh, so that's very very important and lastly we also have to be responsible towards the government right the civic authorities uh, the government has rules and regulations uh, in, in what you can do with the money how you can you know uh, etc so we have to follow those rules uh, the government regulations or uh, religious organizations follow those rules uh, be accountable to them so this is how we have to approach money when it comes to church and Christian ministry, right? So we must not misuse it, handle it with care, be accountable, be ready to answer people when they ask what happened to it, you know, and uh, uh, and don't don't get upset if people ask questions about the money. It's not they are um, they don't have trust. It's just that they want to make sure that. Uh, money they've given is being used in the right sense, in the right way, for the right purpose. Okay, so how do we go about this practically? So one of the things I would recommend is that we use software systems to, you know, to manage all of this. So within India, we use uh, Tally, uh, that's a well-known accounting software system for small businesses uh, and small organizations. So you can buy a license for it, have it installed, and you're going to use that. Uh, or in other places, there are also free accounting software that, that can be used. Um, so at APC, from the very beginning, so from 2001, from the time we started, we, 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 uh, we engaged an accounting company and uh, they would send an accountant and from the very beginning we put all our information into tally so of course in those days it'd be very small amount that came in on a sunday offering uh, but that was all entered in tally. so today we can go back in our accounting records all the way to the very beginning to 2001 and we can say this is what happened you know so it's all there in the system and uh, that's very important now in in uh, uh, in accounting and you don't need to memorize all this but uh, we then generally practice uh, uh, a double entry bookkeep bookkeeping system uh, there are debits and credits right so if something is debited from one side it means it's credited to the other side and so there's a double entry so that what happens is it's like a self checking mechanism you see that okay everything balances your income your expense uh, your uh, receipts and your outflow your expenses kind of match they, they match so uh, it's a double entry uh, system it, the kind of self-checking system of keeping accounts so that, that's what the accountant will do uh, uh, just for you to know it's so not something for you to memorize or anything so that's how we do it and then uh, uh, every so we have we have what is called as a ledger uh, where every transaction is is posted to a ledger account right that means it has to like example if if if, if we spend a thousand rupees in the system you have to say what was that you know which uh, which account which uh, ledger account or head 
was the thousand rupees spent for? So was it under missions? Was it under administration? Was it for a conference? Was it for uh, equipment purchase? You know, what is it? So we can't just say, I spent thousand rupees. No, it has to be posted under a ledger head uh, account, right? So this is very important, right? So you need to tell your accountant that uh, these are all the ledger heads uh, or, uh, that we can use, right? So by church location, it being north, south, east, west, central, Mangalore. So we have all these church locations. So certain expenses are for central, certain are for south or by location. Then we have ministry areas. So certain expenses are for, you know, Christless counseling, for Catalyst, for yeah, APC Music or APC Studio, by different ways. So when there is a transaction, they, they will know, okay, this is for this reason or this, it comes under this head, right? Or by projects, you know, so we have um, example are outreach pastors, which outreach church uh, did this money go? So that way, uh, so you have to tell them, you know, these are all the heads and this keeps growing right as 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 as, as you keep as a ministry grows these heads grow now why is this important so that if you at any point you want to know how much did we spend for men's conference in 2024 oh well, immediately they'll, they'll be able to pull out all the expenses for men's conference and say okay totally for men's conference you spend so much then I will say, uh, I want to compare how much we spent for men's conference for the last three years. They'll just immediately pull it out. Okay, men's conference in 2021, we spent this much. Men's conference 2022, 2023, 2024. Then I can compare, like, you know, are we spent, you know, how is it changing, right? So these, these heads, these ledger heads uh, are very important, right, because you, you can then manage where the money is going, right? So, for example, we say, okay, what percentage of our income is going towards church administration? What percentage is going towards uh, missions? What percentage is going towards conferences? What percentage is going towards uh, the printing and distribution of our books? To all this, what percentage? So, we have all these heads. We can, you know, the accountant can pull it out and tell you, okay, this is where the money is going, right? So breaking this down and, you know, man, keeping this is something you as a pastor, or as a leader, will tell the accountant and say, hey, these are all the ministry areas is where you have to post your, post all transactions. Uh, and uh, and uh, then you can get these reports. You'll have a good, clear idea of where money is going, what where it's being spent, what percentage is being spent, et cetera, right? And also, we have a budget, meaning uh, we tell everybody who are you know, responsible for those ministries, this is how much you can spend. Example, uh, like men's conference, who, there are people who are handling it, or women's conference, or luncheon, or whatever we do. Okay. You, the expenses has to be around this much. You know, okay, let's say, uh, Three lakhs, or three hundred thousand, or four lakhs, four hundred thousand rupees. Everything you do must be in that amount. So then they also know. I've been given this budget. Uh, all the expenses has to fit within that amount. Okay, it may be a little less, a little more, but can't be too too much variation. You know, ten thousand here, there, okay. But that's the amount. So then they can actually plan the event or the conference or the ministry based on that money. And how do you come up, come up with that amount? Well, you look at history, right? You look at the last two, three years, what has happened, and then you can say, this is the budget that we're going to spend this year. Right? Maybe you give a little increase or maybe you make some change. That's okay. But having that is so important, right? So, um, I will pause here for today. I'll just uh, let's take some questions. But this is an important area. We will continue this next week. I'll share some more details on this, how we manage money. I'll uh, we'll get into all the other rules. Um, 
Any questions on this introduction so far? All okay, all clear? Okay. All right, so one other thing, uh, uh, I guess I forgot to mention the very beginning is, um, one mistake or a couple of mistakes that churches, at least in my observation, um, churches, ministries make a couple of mistakes is, one is, especially in the starting, when they get started, one is, uh, a mistake that is oftenly uh, are commonly made is, especially in the early stages, people mix personal and ministry finances together. You know, they mix it all together. So, example, you know, when 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 somebody's starting out in the ministry, uh, the ministry is not registered. So they don't have, obviously, there's no bank account. So what happens? Whatever money comes from ministry or church, it goes into the pastor's personal account. Now that is that is something you should never do. Never. Never means never. From day one. What is given for the church or for the ministry must be kept separate from your personal account. And from the church or ministry, you pay yourself a salary and you pay all the staff a salary and the money goes separately. But the mistake so many people make is everything goes into the personal account, so they lose track what is personal, what is uh, church, and uh, they use the church money as though it was their personal money and uh, it, is, uh, it is very, very messy. Right? So, First rule is don't mix church account and personal account. Don't mix it. Keep it separate. Uh, so the important thing is to, as early as possible in the ministry, when you're starting a church or a ministry, register it and open a separate bank account. And then you start receiving money directly into that separate bank. Put the money there separately. Don't mix it. Another mistake that I've noticed some people make is, especially in the early days, you know, people, uh, especially when they're starting out, um, they may also do a business on the side, pastors, others. You know, they may be doing some business, some source of income while the ministry is growing. The mistake I've noticed is people take church money to run the business. And that is, again, a no-no. Never do it. Never, right? Church money is church money. Personal money is personal money. And if you're going to do a business that has a separate account, do the business completely separate. Don't move money from church to business. But money can go from business to church. That is fine, right? Because that's the whole purpose of the business. You raise money and put it into church, but not the other way. So that's another mistake uh, I've noticed. You know, generally when pastors, especially in the early days when they're starting out, um, uh, some of these mistakes are made. So uh, I thought I'll just mention it. So keep everything separate. And uh, the accounting must be very, very clear. Okay. So we'll stop here for today. We'll continue this next week. And I hope all these practical things will be of help to us. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. We will continue next week. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. God bless.